Hi, Paul and Evelyn Bourne here. We'd like to thank you for all your prayers and support over the last few months and welcome, welcome to, to worship. worship. Good morning. It's great to have you here with us this morning in this worship service. Thank you for being with us here this day. Uh, and as we begin this day, there's just a couple of things that I wanted to talk about. First of all is a thank you to all of those folks who helped us to uh, put on the Red Shield Diner Dinner uh, last night down at the Salvation Army Center in downtown Oklahoma City. Uh, we fed 150 people, that uh, homeless people, as well as people in need, men, women, and children. And so thank you for all those people that have participated in and contributed to that in a variety of different ways. This also is Promotion Sunday. You know, each year we celebrate the kids as they move up into another class level or into another ministry here in the church. For instance, this time of the year, the, the kids who were in the fifth grade, as they move up into the sixth grade, they move up out of the children's ministry and into our youth ministry. And so what I wanted to do today was begin by showing you a little promotion video about those kids that are being promoted this day. I do want to also say that uh, we are, of course, thinking about exactly when and where uh, and how to go about relaunching in-person worship services, and the relaunch team has been meeting, uh, and this week you should be receiving a survey uh, that uh, we've been putting together, a survey about, uh, you know, what your interest in it is in as far as in-person worship and uh, the things that might be involved in that. And so as you get one of those, uh, one of those video, one of those surveys this week, I want to encourage you to make sure and fill that out and uh, send that back to us. Uh, and also it'll be available on our Facebook page and also uh, on our website online. Uh, speaking of in-person, uh, today, that is this uh, Sunday, June the 7th, we're going to be doing drive through communion. For those of you who would prefer to have a, a communion here at the church, what we're going to be doing, it's really pretty simple. Uh, you're going to be coming in through that front entryway, and there are going to be people out there that you know that probably uh, they are going to be greeting you and, and glad to see you, uh, and you'll drive in, and then I and uh, our assistant, we're going to be giving you, uh, providing you with uh, those celebration cups, those enclosed cups that have both the uh, juice as well as the wafer in it, and uh, we're going to be masked up and, uh, and have gloves on and what have you, and giving you as many as you need for your family. Uh, and then you can go and uh, you can either park here in the church and receive, or you can go home and receive. Uh, but uh, there's also going to be an opportunity for you to give an offering here at the church as well. Uh, speaking of that, of course, offerings are a part of our worship of our Lord, uh, and you can do that not only here uh, this Sunday as you go through drive to, through communion, but you can also do that through the mail by sending a check to 10928 Southwest 15th here in Yukon at 73099, or you can do that online. You can go to our website at umcgs.org and scroll down to the page to the Give button and hit the Give button, and that'll send you to our giving portal that shall be next operates, and you can contribute to the general fund through that. Uh, also, I just wanted to close by saying here as we begin this morning that you are going to have an opportunity to do... Uh, to do communion where you're at this day, uh, and it'll be your choice to do it there at home uh, with the elements that you've provided, or you can come here to the church and receive through the drive through communion. But both of those things are going to be options to you this day. With that, let's prepare our hearts and minds to worship the Lord.
As we begin this day, I want to invite you into a responsive call to worship with me as we've been doing each week. And your response, I will point to you and ask you to say these words, your word lived among us full of grace and truth, which of course refers to Jesus Christ. And then I'm going to be saying a section out of Psalm 119, and then we'll finish up by again that response, your word lived among us full of grace and truth. So let's, let us begin this day. First, I want to invite you to response, your word lived among us full of grace and truth. And then listen to these words from one, Psalm 119. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to observe your righteous ordinances. And then your response, your word lived among us full of grace and truth. Amen. Let us pray together. God of love and grace, our nation is in such turmoil. Life is exhausting with a pandemic crisis and race relations blowing up. 
Sorrow is deep. And we pray for George Floyd's grieving family. It is a travesty, God, that we struggle in showing actions of love and kindness to one another, words of hate, Actions of destruction and looting run rampant in major cities. The prayer that beckons to me are the words of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. When there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, Hope, where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Thank you, God, for stories of faith that teach us the best ways to be Christ-like in our words and in our actions. Thank you for the prayer Jesus, Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Join me in reading from our Bible in the book of James, chapter 1, beginning with verse 16 through 18, and then skip to 22 through 25. Every good gift, every perfect gift, comes from above. These gifts come down from the Father, the creator of the heavenly lights, in whose character there is no change at all. He chose to give us birth by his true word, and here is the result. We are like the first crop from the harvest of everything he created. You must be doers of the word and not only hearers who mislead themselves. Those who hear but don't do the word are like those who look at their faces in a mirror. They look at themselves, walk away, and immediately forget what they were like. But there are those who study the perfect law, the law of freedom, and continue to do it. They don't listen and then forget, but they put it into practice in their lives. They will be blessed in whatever they do. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thank you for being here again as we continue on this sermon series on the book of James. And as I was thinking about that this week, I was thinking about all the, the struggles and difficulties that we've been going through recently. And, and I thought, wow, how really uh, this book of James really fits in with what we've been doing. And of course, that's why we're going through in our lives. And that's why we've been looking at that. But before we continue on in this sermon series this day, I want to invite you to bow your heads and let's pray together. Lord, we give you thanks and praise that you are with us this day, wherever we're at, worshiping. We give you thanks that your Holy Spirit is among us and present with us, speaking to our hearts and minds to guide us into your truth. Help us this day to open our hearts to your word, your son Jesus. Help us to be changed. Help us to be encouraged. Help us to be filled with hope as we look to him. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's been kind of a heck of a year, hasn't it? I was just thinking about it as we uh, came into the first part of June here, the last few days, that what has happened in the last five months? Holy moly. Uh, we, of course, started the year with the impeachment of the President of the United States. Uh, that was an interesting first uh, few weeks there in the, the year. Uh, and that was quickly transitioned into, well, into the pandemic, the global pandemic that we've not only had to, to struggle with and, and all the kinds of problems that are connected with that, but, uh, you know, we still have it around. And I noticed actually this week that there's been a slight uptick here recently uh, in the number of cases here in the, in the Canadian County area, for instance. Uh, and uh, so that's went on. And then there is this, uh, the tragedy, the, the horrible thing that has uh, happened uh, up in Minnesota, uh, and just heartbreaking to, to look at that. Uh, I know I was talking to my son, and he was asking me, did you watch the video? And I said, son, I, I, saw, I saw the image. That was enough. I, I knew what was going to happen just looking at that image because it was just heartbreaking to take a look at it. And so, so we've been going through some uh, times of great instability uh, from uh, the, the impeachment to the COVID crisis, the pandemic, the loss of 40 million some jobs, uh, and uh, the racial unrest, the protest. Thank God that we have the ability to protest in this country, right? And then also the rioting uh, that has happened, uh, not only here, na not only nationally, but also here locally. And, and in the midst of that, I was just wondering, uh, have you been feeling kind of like you've been going through a storm? Uh, have you been feeling kind of like there's some instability in your life? Well, if you have, then you know what it was, what it was like to live as Christians that James was writing to. Those folks were going through a time of great instability in their lives. It wasn't a time in the sense that they had a pandemic or something that they were dealing with, but it was a time where they were dealing with persecution. And when I'm talking persecution, I'm not talking about somebody saying, oh, there's one of those Christians. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about where the government came in and would arrest them and throw them into prison, uh, would try them uh, in a public forum, uh, would also sometimes they would beat them, sometimes they whipped them, and sometimes some of them got executed. They lost their property. So they're going through some really difficult times, times of great instability in their lives. And the question that uh, James asked when he started this book was, okay, do you folks that are going through those instabilities, you've got to realize, first of all, that, that, you know, life is full of change and life is full of trouble. I mean, that's just the way it is, but we're not alone in our troubles. God is always there walking with us to support us and strengthen us. And he reaches out his hand to give, to take our hand and lead us. And then there was also the question of, okay, so if we're going through these uh, instabilities, how do I make wise decisions? And we talked about how James was trying to teach the folks how to make good decisions, wise decisions in even an unstable time. And then the last week we were talking about how, yes, as he said, uh, there was a problem about the trials that are going through and also about the uh, indecisions and the need for wisdom. But there's also a question of, well, a question of uh, the old habits that kick in and the old flaws that kick in. And what do we do about those? But today he moves on in this particular section of the first chapter of James, and he wants to talk about where do we get stability in an unstable time? And not surprisingly, he starts talking in a way that was, well, kind of like his, his half-brother. His half-brother, of course, was Jesus. And uh, we reminded, as I was reading this passage, this section of the book of James this week, I was reminded of, well, I was reminded of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and where Jesus talks about how do you find stability in an unstable time, in an unstable world. And at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this, and I want to just look at this first uh, scripture passage this morning, where Jesus says this, everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who builds his house on rock. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, 
but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. Okay, so now what is Jesus saying there? He's saying that, look, of all the things that you can do in your life, here's the most important one, and that is to listen to me and then to act on what I'm telling you. And he says, if you'll do that, if you'll listen to me and not listen to all the other voices that are trying to drag you in this way and that way, but if you'll listen to me and follow my word and do what I tell you to do, then your life will be, will be founded on the ultimate rock. And in unstable times, you'll have stability. And I would say, wouldn't that be what all of us would want in our lives, to have that sense of stability even in the, the most unstable of times? And so then Jesus goes on, and he's, and he's talking about, you know, the uh, rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew. And, and what are those things that kind of, uh, kind of drive us in instability? Uh, some of them is, well, some of it comes from our culture. Some of it comes from the changes that we go through in our lives. You know, uh, I, it's amazing the, um, if you just think about it, the amount of change that, that has happened over the past, say, 50 years or 60 years uh, uh, from, let's say, in the early 60s or something like that. It's been incredible. Or the crises, the number of crises that we, we uh, you know, go through and, and how that creates instability in our lives. And he says, in the midst of all that, found your life on me and do what I say and you'll find stability there. Now, he gives us the kind of the other, the other part of that. Uh, there, continuing on in that next uh, section there on the Sermon on the Mount when he says this, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was its fall. And what is he saying? He says, you've got a choice. You can listen to me, he says. You can build your life on me and on what I'm telling you to do, and you'll be fine. But you can listen to other voices that are trying to pull you in all kinds of different directions, and in the process, you're going to run into some serious trouble in your life and struggles in your life. And you're going to find that there's instability in your life. And so he says, the choice is up to you, and the choice is up to me. Now, would it surprise you that if James, his half-brother, kind of hits that kind of same note there in the first chapter of the book of James when he says this? Listen to this next passage from the first chapter of the book of James. Every, every generous act of giving and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purposes, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So what's he saying there? He says, again, if you want to found your life on something, found your life on that perfect gift from your Father in heaven. Let me ask some. have you ever had a gift and you looked at it and you kind of wondered, well, what am I going to do with that? Uh, you know, I'm thinking, Father, I was thinking this week, Father's Day is coming up, and I don't know about some of you dads, but sometimes Father's Day, what happens is, uh, every once in a while, I've gotten a present or two, and I've looked at that present, and I've, I've really appreciated the thought, you know, and, and the gift, but I've looked at him and thought, what am I going to do with that? Why would they buy that for me, you know? <laughs> sometimes that happens with my giving stuff to other people, too. But he says, oh, God gives you the perfect gift. And the perfect gift, the good gift that every person in this world needs is the word of truth. The word of truth that he gives from above. That's the way to found your life. That's the way to find stability in, un in changing and unstable times is to look to that word. Now, so what I want to do this morning is I, I just want to take a a couple of things and take a look at them uh, because at one point, uh, just like Jesus lays it out there at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, so James, his half-brother, lays it out as well. It's very simple. It says, uh, there is first, am I going to hear God's Word? And the second is, am I going to do God's Word? Am I going to hear God's Word and I'm gonna do God, am I going to do God's Word? So let's take a look first at the hearing God's Word. Now, if you notice there in that Scripture passage, it says, the word of truth, that, that that word of truth gave us birth and gave us life and created all things and made us part of that creation. And that same word of truth, well, where do we find that today? You know, somebody will say, well, the word of God says, okay, so we ask, well, what's the word of God? Well, it's not a question of what, it's a question of who. Who is the word of God? Now, who is the word of God? Well, you know, 
I'm looking at this passage this week that James writes, and he writes about the word of truth, and I'm thinking, you know, as he wrote that, that must have been a kind of an interesting experience because here is James, the half-brother of the Lord, and he grew up around Jesus, and he listened to Jesus, uh, and yet because of he was so close, it was like he couldn't see who Jesus was. And at one point it says that uh, Mary and his brothers come uh, down and try and find Jesus because they think Jesus has just gone nuts, and they're going to drag Jesus away and kind of, kind of set on him so that maybe they can calm him down because there are times in James' life when he knew, the, who knew who the word of truth was. He'd heard the word of truth, but he didn't understand him because the word of truth is not a what, it's a who. It's Jesus Christ, the word made flesh, the Son of God, the eternal Son of God who dwelt among us full of grace and truth as of the only begotten of the Father. That's the word of truth. That's the word of God. Now, there are some witnesses to that word, and that's why, what, that's why we call the Bible. Those witnesses that God has chosen to use in order to bear witness to that word of God, Jesus Christ. And so, the question is, okay, so if we're going to know Jesus, and if we're going to found our lives on Jesus, it would kind of be good for us to, to listen to that word, uh, that word is in the Bible, uh, as, the, as the true witness, as the chosen witness of Jesus Christ, as the chosen witness of God, and be taught about what life is, and to be taught about what truth is through that. And so, James gives us a little bit of advice, and he says, okay, so now, the first thing he says is you need to, first of all, if you're going to listen to that word and hear that word, you need to remove, he says, all the filth and all this other stuff that's in your life. And it's interesting because the Greek word that's there that's used in that particular term uh, in those particular passages is really a word for, well, sometimes it's used as a word for earwax. I got earwax, and I can't hear anything, and I need to get some earwax out. And he says, you need to remove the earwax. You need to remove the clutter in your mind in order to focus on the Word. You know, um, a few days ago, I was watching a movie, and it's uh, based on a true story. Uh, and it's about this young man who is a, uh, he was a, a gymnast at a university out in California. And he was a good gymnast. This was a really good uh, gymnastics team. Uh, and he was, but he was also, he's a little bit, conceited, a little bit self-absorbed, a little bit prideful, and, and kind of arrogant, and has some, some serious flaws. Uh, and uh, one particular evening, he gets on his bike, and he's riding around in the campus area there, and he goes to this little, uh, this little uh, gas station. He pulls in there, and he's going to get some, something to eat, something to drink, just something quickly. And he goes in, and he gets into a conversation with this guy who's a service station attendant there. Now, you know, some, a lot of people think, well, service station attendants, they're not too bright. Well, you know, I've known some service station attendants. They're pretty bright people. And he gets into this conversation with this service station attendant about life. And, uh, you know, this guy is trying to teach him and trying to kind of lead him in a little better way than he's been in. Uh, and at one point, they're sitting a and in this office of this uh, gas station. And the guy says, you know what you need to do? You need to take out the trash. And the guy, this young guy looks at the trash can. He says, so... You, need, if you say, I need to take out this trash can over here and throw it into the dumpster back in the back. Is that what you're saying? He said, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. I said, he says, I'm telling you, take out the trash in here, in here. Take this out. Because he says, you got so much going on in here that you can't hear what I'm trying to say to you. And you can't live right now. And in order to hear, the first thing you got to do is you got to take out, you got to take this stuff out. And that's what James is saying. Take the earwax out. Take the earwax out so you can hear. And then he says, humbly approach, humbly accept the word of life. And then say, that, you know, you and me, we've got to get down on our knees and we've got to say, Lord, I just don't understand this. I need for you to lead me. I don't understand what's going on in my life and I need for you to help me. He says, that's, that's the beginning of how to do this to take the earwax out and to humble ourselves before the, before the Lord. Now, in that process, he also says, 
it's important for us to be not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Uh, and again, I, I just think about Jesus and James, you know, when they were, when they were young and, and he's around, he's listening to Jesus and maybe he said, just something hits him. He said, well, Jesus, I think he's got something there. Uh, and then he kind of goes off and he's, oh, you know, that's, that's just my brother. You know, my brother. So James is kind of writing from personal experience here, I would guess. And he says this, he says, See, a lot of times what happens is when we, when we listen to the, the Word of God, when we, we try and understand the Word of God, it's kind of like looking in a mirror. And he says, and you're looking in this mirror, and you realize, oh, wait a second, my hair is all messed up, and oh, I got some mud on my face, and what I, boy, I got to do something about that. And then he says, and we walk away from the mirror, and as we walk away from the mirror, all of a sudden we forget about the you know, hair messed up and mud on my face, and we don't even worry about it. We don't change anything. We just go back to the way things were. And he says, no, 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 don't do it like that. He says, instead, when you listen to the word, and it's like a mirror, and it, you, you see who you really are, what you need to do is you need to figure out, okay, so what do I need to do now? What's the word telling me to do now that I need to change? Now, I want to suggest how this week you can listen to the word. And how that you can kind of set yourself up to, to not only be a hearer, but a doer of the word. Uh, and uh, I've been practicing this for a while, uh, and I want to suggest this to you. And it's a little, a little a saying, God's word, first word. God's word, last word. God's word, first word. God's word, last word. Now, what do I mean by that? Okay, so what I do is I have a, a little nightstand next to the bed, and uh, where I sleep at, and, and uh, you know, I, I've got uh, that in that uh, cell phone. I've got the cell phone on there, and we're in the cell phone, I've got a Bible app, and I've got a Bible app uh, that is turned to a specific type of uh, translation of the Bible. And the first thing I do, the first thing, not the second thing or the third thing, the first thing I do when I wake up is I pick up that cell phone, I turn it to the Bible app, I turn it to the point that I've been reading at, and I start reading the Bible. And I read until I think that God has, has said something to me that I feel like, okay, God is speaking to me about something here. And I stop there. That may be one verse, maybe two verses. It may be 15, 20 verses. You know, it just depends upon the day. And I come to that point where I, I realize that God has said something to me. And then I thought, okay, so now what have I got to do today in order to act on that, on what God is trying to say to me? And I, what am I going to do? Get some specific ideas. And then I go to the very end of the day, uh, and just as I'm getting ready to close my eyes and go to sleep, I pick up that cell phone again, I turn it to that Bible app to the exact place that I left off in the morning, and I start reading again. And I read until I feel God has said something to me about my life. And I think to myself, okay, what do I need to do tomorrow in order to get aligned with what God is trying to tell me? That's for God's word, first word. God's word, last word, and that's how we start to hear. But he said, James says, there's a difference between hearing and doing. And, you know, I was thinking this week, I don't know exactly how to explain the doing except by giving you a couple of examples. They're very interesting examples. And so how do you, how do you take that word and how do you, as Paul says, work out your salvation? With fear and trembling for it is God who is at work within you, both to will and to work for his good. How do, I, how do I let God work within me to change me so that I start living out the word? Let me give you a couple of examples. First is a guy who grew up in poverty, uh, and he grew up in a city. Uh, and when he got to teenage years, he got into a gang. This particular gang was known for using knives. Uh, it was known for slashing people. Uh, it then was known for uh, using a knife to stab people, knives to stab people to death that they didn't like. This was, you know, this was a tough gang, right? And not surprisingly, this kid who was raised in poverty and raised in kind of a volatile environment, who'd had no father there at the home, and and uh, you know had some some troubles as a, in a, as early teenage years as sometimes happens. Uh, well. Uh, he got to the point where he was just like in an kind of explosive anger at times. Sometimes he just anger would just like explode. And he didn't have any control over it. 
And that, co- that manifested itself in different instances there in his teenage years. For instance, the one time where he took a hammer and he tried to hit his mom in the head with a hammer because they got into an argument over clothes. Or another time when he was riding in a car with uh, uh, one of his friends and his friends changed the channel that the radio was on and he pulled the knife and he tried to stab his friend. Unfortunately, the knife hit a belt buckle that the friend was wearing and he, it popped and it broke the blade. But he had no control over his anger and he was leading him down the wrong path. And he kind of finally woke up to that and he thought, okay, I, I, I got to change something. I got to get out of this. And so what he did was he decided he would turn to the Bible and he would see, is there something in the Bible that tells me about anger and how I can get control of this anger and what that would look like? And so what he did was he turned to Proverbs. And I just want to show you a couple of verses uh, there from Proverbs. Let's, Let's look at these. Here's one. One who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and one whose temper is controlled is better than one who captures the city. Those with good sense are slow to anger, and it is their glory to overlook an offense. And so he started learning there from the Bible about how to control his anger and about what that would look like and why that was important. And he said, and he said after all, I got started to get in control of my anger, and I didn't have these kind of extreme outbursts. And one day he had a chance to practice it. It was on the day in 1968 when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And he said he was there at the high school, and there at the high school there was a riot that broke out, and there in the riot there were some other classmates there, and he said I, he defended them against those people that were rioting in order that those people that were different than he was wouldn't get harmed. Now that's what it looks like to be a, not simply a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. Speaking of Martin Luther King Jr., you know, for some reason or other, I probably can imagine this week, I, uh, I started reading again Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail. If you've never read that, I really would encourage you to, to get on the Internet today and, and read a letter from a Birmingham jail. Uh, and he says something very profound at the beginning of it. He says, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And isn't that true? That if we let justice be violated somewhere... It's a threat to justice everywhere. And then he went on to talk about, he went on to talk about uh, how he lived that out. And he talked about how, okay, so I, I've got uh, a, a method that I use in doing this. Now, I want you to listen to the four points of his method. The first one, he says, is I get the facts. Wow, wouldn't that be different? I get the facts. I don't rush to judgment. I listen, I learn, and I get the facts about the situation and make sure, are there injustices happening there? And then he said, the second thing I do is I enter into negotiations. I try and to, to get into negotiations with the people that are in power in that particular area in order to help uh, to get uh, into a better situation. And he said, in particular, it happened there in Birmingham. He went to the, the local merchants Uh, And he had a negotiation with them that, you know, those colored only signs that you hear about or some of us have seen in our lives uh, to get those removed from stores. And he said some of them came down, some of them didn't. Those that did came, come down, all of a sudden it wasn't too long until they were back up. And so I said, well, the negotiations didn't go too well. And so he said the third thing we do is we do self-purification. Now, there's an interesting concept. Before I act, I purify myself. And he said the way we do that is we draw in people and we, we uh, and train them in nonviolent, non-cooperation. And he says, we asked him this simple question, are you able, are you able when, uh, you, when you receive a blow not to retaliate? And if you're not able to receive, to receive the blow and not retaliate, then, then we can't have you in the march. And then he said after that, then comes the direct action of a boycott or a march or or something like that where we make known what is needed in order to change towards justice. And I thought, wouldn't those be novel ideas today? Now, where do you think he got that from? Let's go back to the Sermon on the Mount. Listen to this section from the Sermon on the Mount. 
You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye. In other words, equal retributive justice. You did something to me, I'm going to do something to you. And a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. And who is that? It was the Word of God that spoke that. The Word of God that it's trying to lead us in a different way. You know, uh, years later, one of his, uh, uh, one of Martin Luther King Jr.'s young assistants, who is, I believe, still in Congress, uh, he made this statement. He was talking about those people who would attack them on these marches, and he said, he said, if you could get to the point, he said, where, where you could see that attacker, uh, not somebody, as somebody that you, just, you should hate, or somebody who is your enemy, but you should see that attacker as somebody who is as stuck in that situation as you were. And had been molded by uh, the forces uh, that fed their fury and their anger. He said, then you could become that kind of nonviolent person that Jesus was. He's calling us this day. He's saying, listen to my word. In all the chaos, in all of your lives, in all the instability, guess what's the rock of stability? It's my word, he says. It's the word of Jesus. Let's pray together. We praise you, Lord. We give you thanks that you opened us a different way, a better way the perfect way, the true way, the good way, that perfect gift that has been given to us by the Father of lights. Help us to humble ourselves. Help us to take the earwax out and to listen to your word. And help us this day not simply to be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. We ask these things in your name. Amen. We continue on now in our worship service with the uh, Sacrament of Holy Communion. Uh, and today you're going to be given a couple of options. One is, as we've been doing over the last few weeks, to have your own elements uh, there in your home or place of residence, wherever you're at right now, uh, and participate in communion that way. Or, uh, if you would like, uh, or in addition, by the way, uh, you can come down to the church. And you'll notice here I have a, a box of celebration cups that we're going to be using later on. Uh, at, from 1 to 2 o'clock here on June the 7th to be receiving out in the parking lot a drive through communion. Uh, and uh, so that's going to be your option, however you would like to do that. But uh, as we begin this day, let's uh, bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for your goodness and grace towards us, such an infinite grace and love for us that you have. We give you thanks that your word of truth brought us into being and gave us our lives and gave us a part of this creation and the beautiful universe that you have created for us. We give you thanks that your love and your grace has been poured upon us throughout our lives. We give you thanks also that in the fullness of time you sent your son Jesus Christ to be born like one of us. The word became flesh, uh, born in a manger and uh, also in the same struggles and troubles and difficulties that we have. And yet he, he lived out not only being the word of truth but teaching us the word of truth. You remember how on the night in which he was betrayed as he gathered in the upper room with his disciples, he took the cup, he gave it to them, he blessed it, and he said, drink of this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. He also there at the cup at the supper took the bread, he broke it, he gave it to them and said, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and also in wherever else we may be this morning uh, and this day as we gather to worship. Uh, pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts here at this altar and also in those places of worship uh, that people are watching at today uh, that you would be just blessing their elements as well. Let them become for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Now I want to invite you, if you would take time uh, to gather together your elements, if you're going to be doing this there at the place that you're going to be watching this morning, and I'm going to be preparing the altar here as well. So let's take some moments to gather those together. This is the body of Christ broken for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you. I want to invite you now, if you're going to be doing that, to go ahead and receive there at your home. Now I want to invite you to turn to our prayer after communion and let's pray this prayer together. You have given yourself to us, Lord. Now we give ourselves to others. You are our help and our strength. Through your resurrection, we have become a people of hope. Amen. Thank you again for being here this day. Just a couple of quick reminders. First of all, thanks to all those people who helped with the Red Shield uh, dinner uh, as we served 150 people this weekend that were in need. Also, uh, congratulations to all the kids for going through promotion Sunday this day. And I just ask that God would bless and guide you in your long, young lives as you move forward. I also want to just remind you there's going to be drive through communion available to you uh, at, from 1 to 2 p.m. out here in the parking lot here on uh, June the 7th. Uh, and invite you to come to that. And also, don't forget uh, worship. Uh, part of worship is our offerings to the Lord, and there are a couple of ways that you can do that. One is through mailing your check-in here to the church to support the ministries of the gospel through Good Shepherd. And the other one is by going online uh, at umcgs.org and scrolling down the page to the Give button, and you get that, and it'll take you to our uh, giving portal, and you can make a contribution there to the general fund of our church, and we'd appreciate that too. I want to thank all the musicians all the technicians that are part of this each week in order to make this worship service possible. And, uh, you know, we, we just give, you, uh, give thanks and praise to their gifts that they've given to us and uh, not uh, to not simply the people that are here, but also to all of us and to people that are, that are beyond this church family, the extended church family, that are actually literally looking at this thing across the United States in various places. Thank you for joining us for worship, and I want to invite you to please share this worship service with someone that you know, and to make sure and ask them to be a part of worship next week. And here, may you receive this benediction. May God bless you and encourage you and strengthen you as you move forward in your life this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.